Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Happy July. Um, so this month, in honor of the Feast of Mary Magdalene, uh, her feast day is July 22nd. For um, the, these Friday Facebook Lives, I'm going to share some of my story. Um, I'm often asked how I get how I got started uh, on this whole priestess path, and um, there are lots of twists and turns. But I wanted to share a few, um, I guess, highlight moments that were pivotal for me, um, and that have brought about the um, different ways I I uh, am attempting to be of service in the world now and in alignment with that calling. So this week segment, uh, as I shared, is on how I came to what I'm calling fire my gods, uh, to fire the gods of my childhood, really, um, and to offer a few prompts um, and reflections, opportunity for a reflection for um, your own, wherever you are in your own journey with this. So if you are watching this now or or later, I'm curious just to, to learn more about like who uh, who's with me, you know, in this journey. Um, so I'd love to hear if you want to just put in the chat. Uh, you can put a one in the chat if you were raised in a religious household, and a two if you were um, not raised religious. And then if you're um, in that first category, if you were raised religious, I'd love to hear if um, you were raised Christian, you could just put a one in the chat. And if you were raised something other than Christian, you can put a two in the chat. And that just helps me kind of gauge um, who's who's with me today and yeah, how to connect, how to um, speak, speak with folks with similarities and with differences. So love to hear where folks are at. <clears throat> Some of you may already know this, but I, because uh, I share it pretty commonly, that uh, I was raised in a very ritualistic Catholic family. Uh, I've always been surrounded by um, religion and spirituality, always been a spiritual seeker myself. Um, but as a young adult, I, I know like many, I left the church and got really into uh, yoga and Eastern mysticism and um, yeah, found myself immersed in, you know, traditions that were not a part of my original lineage. Um, I got really into studying the goddess tradition, particularly with the teacher Sally Kempton. And <clears throat> the story I want to tell today comes from one of the early practices I did with Sally um, in a contemplative practice with the, the energy, the frequency of the goddess Parvati. And, you know, I, I sometimes feel a little shy sharing this part of my journey. I know it's now like kind of not as culturally correct or whatever to um, have ex um, experiences or connections to lineages that aren't my own. Uh, art one's own. Um, but this was, this just was one of those pivotal moments. And I do think because our culture, uh, at least the way that I experienced it, was so um, fractured and I was still so starved for actual like spiritual nourishment in my um, tradition of origin that it really did take going to um, uh, a, a, a spiritual tradition, a cultural tradition that is somewhat more intact um, and being able to just experience something different there. So I'll, yeah, I'll, sh I'll just want to share a little bit about that experience. And, and, and then I'm curious to hear like what, what were the, what have been those sort of pivotal, mo pivotal moments um, for you all? where you got kind of a glimpse of something different than what you had maybe been raised with or grown up to know. So in this particular practice, we were guided to um, just call into our visual imagination um, an image of 
this feminine face of this feminine face of the divine. And um, I believe the particular story of Parvati is um, that she stands in tree pose in meditation, uh, just in total focus and um, devotional practice calling upon Shiva to wake wake up Shiva um, out of this like deep desire and love to know to know Shiva. And so we're doing this meditation um, and imagining that feminine form of the divine coming before us. And for the first time, I had a, a sense of the divine being someone that could look like me, someone that had a feminine form, had a feminine face. I had a sense of, yeah, of like familiarity or kinship with uh, an image of the divine in a way that I had never quite experienced before. And in addition to that familiarity, I also had a real felt presence. Like, you know, one could say we were just like imagining it or whatever, but our imaginations are powerful communicators from the spirit world. And through that, I had at least the first of my, my kind of adult memory, um, a sense of encounter with divine presence, like being able to come into contact with something that was both familiar, close, and, and, and also wholly other. So, of course, um, you know, the sacred goes beyond gender, but it was a critical moment for me to realize that even though consciously I wouldn't have said I believed God was male, at a deep level, that was what I believed. And what was even more important about this moment was that I could see that I had never truly believed I could have my own access, that I could have my own point of connection to God, to divinity. That again, on some deep level, I wouldn't have been able to say this, you know, that I, I would have, I wouldn't have thought I believed this in a conscious way, but it really revealed that what I had, you know, I think been shaped to believe, what many of us are shaped to believe, that I could only access God, that I could only access the, the wholeness um, that is creation and the source of creation through particularly the church and through my childhood symbol of the church, which was, which for me was my father. So that the contrast of that particular encounter in, in relation to all my previous sort of experiences of God um, she really showed me the um, the deep unconscious belief that was forming that undercurrent of my relationship to myself and to the created world and to the sacred. So it really highlighted for me, or it was, it was a pivotal moment for me in realizing that everything that I thought God to be previously was at best incomplete and had to go. So this was when I fired God. Um, that is started to clear out all my ideas about God and started to orient myself towards listening more to this new inner felt sense of affinity and kinship, of, of connection, of just following these little threads of, of connection. And that was just the beginning. I mean, I've had to repeat this cycle many times over. I'm sure I'll need to do it many times over. Um, and, you know, as 
some of you may know from the apophatic tradition, the mystics will say that the moment we've decided we know what God is, it's no longer God. So even in that moment, like I've had to un undo or clear out the insight that I had in that moment, right? Um, because sacred presence also waxes and wanes. And there is still a, 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 a divinity in what might be felt as absence or divine absence, also part of the apophatic tradition. So it didn't unlock some kind of permanent state of connection or whatever, um, some like blissful, you know, awakening. But it was a beginning. A, it was a taste of something, um, of experiencing in myself, in in my beingness, both a familiarity with with the sacred, um, as well as a an otherness that was that I felt a magnetism to, not not a not a kind of severance from that I think is much more. Um, at least has become much more sort of the dominant flavor in Western Christianity, that, that total separation um, from the Godhead or whatever. Um, and I think it really marked the beginning of being able to actually feel, like actually sense my body as a part of the goodness of the body of the goddess, a part of divine um, participation. And, you know, I think I had been doing yoga for a while at that point. I think I would have probably had the thought, you know, that, yeah, of course our body is good. And, but it really took having an experience of that to um, in, unroot the, the disbelief or unroot the old belief. <clears throat> So I'm curious if there's any part of the story you can relate to. Um, and if there is any piece that speaks to you, you know, if you're watching this now or if you're watching this in the future, I'd love to just hear a word or a phrase. You can just put it in the chat. Like what, what word or phrase is sticking out to you or resonating uh, to your experience? So I do want to just say a few things you know, maybe from my like retrospective, um, you like, yeah, reflective place that there are, of course, many instances where we need the reminder that we are not God, right? Uh, and I, I, I feel sort of self-conscious that like this realization might, you know, it might sound kind of narcissistic or whatever. And it, um, certainly that is a problem that we're encountering in the world right now too, right? But at that time, as, you know, someone who lives in a female body has been conditioned as a, um, a female bodied person, as a queer person raised in Western Christianity, this, that insight really restored something in me, um, through this different spiritual tradition that the possibility that God could bear my image and that, that I could bear the image of, of the sacred, that there was something profoundly restoring in that, that has continued to sort of stabilize a sense of inner, you know, again, waxes and wanes, but like a sense of inner security, um, a sense of, uh, participation in the wholeness of things um, and a sense of having access, you know, having my own body, my own being, being a, a, a line of connection to the, to the cosmos, to the, the, to the beloved. And there is that kind of restoration is actually a remedy in my experience, at least in my opinion, it's actually a remedy to narcissism. It actually brings a kind of humility, a kind of, you know, earth, earthbound humility um, that 
yeah, <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. It, it. I think it's actually a balm to narcissism. And I'll also say, you know, again, my retrospective view has some critique about like the layers of, you know, cultural and racial complexity that I wasn't just wasn't tuned into at the time. Like that, yes, the goddess Parvati, she is not just doesn't just bear a woman's form she bears a brown woman's form which is not the image that i bear right so there is nuance um and complexity there that's that that's definitely worth spending time with um but for the sake of just the story and the time that i have today i i do want to highlight how this experience of visceral physical divine presence and this deep insight that my actual flesh, my physical flesh was a for real mirror of the goddess of divine participation. This was a critical insight that actually, even though I experienced it in, um, you know, a different spiritual tradition, it would eventually allow me to return to Christianity with a, a, a kind of different knowingness in myself. And I'll share about this in the coming weeks because that act, that actual physicality, that actual uh, divine participation in our physicality is quite orthodox in Christianity, if you um, kind of go far back enough. But it's been all but lost to, you know, lots of things, platonic dualism, patriarchy, colonialism, all the things. Um, so hello, if you're joining me now, welcome. Thanks for being here. And um, I know you might have not have all the context here, but I'll just invite you to share if in the chat, if you have struggled to reconcile being a physical being with your spiritual or religious, just, you can put a one in the chat if that relates to you. So this could be anything from, you know, experiencing sexual shame or dissociation from, from your body or dysmorphia around uh, physicality or gender. So if there has felt like a disconnect between yeah your physical experience as a human being and your spirituality or spiritual religious heritage i'd love to know if that connects for you and then i'd also love to hear if, if anyone has had what they would consider like a felt sense of divine presence what does divine presence feel like for you and you can just put a hey or a yes uh in the chat if that um, has been a part of your experience. And if not, no worries. <laughs> um, there, there's, it's not a, a prerequisite, um, but I do think it is, um, those are, um, those can be kind of moments of opening where we get a, um, an experience of something that's different than um, the way we've been sort of conditioned to see things, or experience things. And both of these, at least for my in my experience, the struggle as well as these moments of connection or insight, both are key ent entry points to the spiritual path. So I'll just invite us to hold these moments, again, the, both the struggle as well as the insights, um, with a kind of open openness, curiosity, a lightness, so like playfulness, like, oh, where can this take take me, take us? So that's installment one of the origin of the priestess. And I'll invite you to stay tuned next week for part two, uh, which I call Getting Funky with Jesus, which this one is a story I've told a lot, so you may have already heard it, but if you want to hear it again or the most current version of it um join me next week and then yeah just before we close i'd love to share about um the opportunity that i'm that's open right now that i've created for what i'm calling um, community supported spiritual care so like you know a community supported agriculture where you buy in for a season and you get what's um, what's growing in the farm that season. I'm I'm looking for 15 to 25 uh, what we might call patrons or partners or um, community care 
support um, allies for a not church, church-ish community, um, community spiritual care offer of seasonal land-based group ritual practice and celebration. My dream, my end goal dream is to make these available at sliding scale or pay what you can um, with drop-in options. You know, you can bring a friend, but I have been really learning for my own sustainability. I need to know I have a certain amount of committed participants and to be super frank income coming from this. So that's the sort of, you know, CSA, community support, spiritual clear um, model of it. So if I can get 15 to 25 folks who can commit to a contribution of, you know, 50 to $250 a month and can commit to at least six months paying at that rate, these are folks who want to shift a sense of personal powerlessness of, the, of self or other into collective resilience over the next six months through these monthly seasonal community celebrations. It's uh, gonna include song, uh, movement, sharing, very simple, accessible earth-based body and body-based rituals. Um, you know, I'm calling it, calling it kind of like church, but for folks who aren't in a church. So through your commitment of these, you know, 15 to 25 people, you'll make this offer available to the whole community. And I'll put the whole description for who this is for and what's going on in the chat below. And if it's you, here's the game. You can just put the word solstice in the chat and I'll message you with the complete details. <clears throat> so I wanna leave you now with a very simple practice for feeling into where you are in your own journey um, from perhaps a sense of being a spiritual orphan of not having that, that sacred home towards or building towards um, a deep rootedness, a deep sense of being grounded, of being at home in your own body, in your relationships and in the web of life. That's really what my work is orienting towards. That's really what uh, I have been pursuing in my own practice and what I really wanna um, help others to experience as well. So the simple practice that maybe I'll even set it up as like a dare, I dare you to try this, is to set the timer for three minutes, go find a mirror, start your timer and look in the mirror, look into your own eyes and imagine that what you see is the goddess or God looking back at you. Can you imagine the goddess looking back at you through your own face? And just see what happens as you stay with that image, with your own image for the three minutes if you can. Notice what you notice. And if you want to, I would love to hear in the comments what the experience was like. If you want to extra challenge yourself, you might do this every day for five days or for a week, or I was challenged once to do it every day for 30 days. So just, yeah, I'll let you play with that and whatever version is kind of calling to you to set the timer, find a mirror. The timer is important because if we don't have know that there's like some container to the thing, it'll just feel, you know, too willy nilly or whatever. So the timer is important. And then just be with your image as if the goddess was looking back at you. Okay. So thanks so much for hanging out. Um, I will talk with y'all next week. I'd love to hear any feedback you have or comments you have, um, anything that resonated with you, anything you're taking with you. Um, I'll just close by saying maybe like it is, it's tough out there right now. Um, it, things are, hard. It's really hard to be in the world right now. 
uh, I'm feeling that myself and I, I know others are feeling it as well. So um, just really want to, yeah, remind you that you're not alone in it um, and that as best we can each do to hold our own grounding and be of service in the spheres of influence where we are connected in the ecologies where we're connected. Just let's stay with it. Okay, so lots of love, everyone, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.